Hi everyone, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. In this episode, I'm really excited I'm chatting with Professor Damien Hughes. Damien is an international speaker and best-selling author. He's also trusted advisor to the business, education and sporting elite. He specialises in the creation of high-performing cultures. He's also written a lot of books. He's author of Liquid Thinking, Liquid Leadership, How to Change Absolutely Anything, How to Think Like Sir Alex Ferguson, The Five Steps to a Winning Mindset, and most recently, The Barcelona Way. And in this episode, we're going to be speaking mainly about this book, The Barcelona Way, honing in on the culture of commitment that Barcelona have instilled at their club. This book is a really fascinating read. It tells how Barcelona have put people at the forefront of their culture and how they've sustained success for two and a half times longer than the average successful sporting team. Damien has so much great information in this book. I know you're going to love this podcast. He really brings to life exactly what Barcelona do on a day-to-day basis. Before we start, just to let you know, we had a few technical problems about halfway through the show, but it shouldn't impact your listening pleasure at all. So let's get on with the show, introducing Professor Damien Hughes on the Sports Psych Show. Professor Damien Hughes, thank you very much for joining me on the Sports Psych Show. Um, delighted, oh, it's a pleasure, Dan. Delighted to have you on. Uh, we've just been chatting away there for quite some time, saying how <laughs> we've, we've known of each other and known of each other's work and uh, admired each other from a distance or so. So I can only but say I'm a big admirer of your work and, and read all, all of your books. And, but we'd never, we, we've never met, but we'd never spoken before. So at last, we speak. <laughs> yeah, it's a real pleasure, Dan, honestly, because like you say, I'm a, I'm a huge um, admirer of what you've done and I know you've got a stellar reputation within sport and within the psych world. So uh, it's a real honour to, to finally get a chance to speak with you. Well, I'll try not to let myself down in the next hour. And I, I, one, thing I've, one thing I've always noticed, because as I say, we've never met, but, you know, you're a pretty young guy and, and yet you are Professor Damien Hughes. So that, that's pretty impressive. You don't look like a professor. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> trying, to, trying to stereotype professors here, but please tell me you've got some, some pads on, your, on the backs of your arms of your uh, jacket. I've got tweed jackets. Tweed I've, jacket, got the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, got the, I've got the elbow pads. I will say it's like the professorship's a real, and like it. I am really proud of it. But I remember when um, when I first got made up, um, you have to do this welcome lecture at the university where they had it at the town hall and they invited um, all these people to come along and listen to you to like fellow deans at the uni and things like that. And um, my one diva request I made was I said to them, I said, I want my mum and my auntie Pat to be the guests of honour. And uh, they said, oh, why is that? And I said, well, they don't know what I do. And I think it would just be reassuring if they could come along and we can make a fuss of them. So it was the first time my mum had heard me speak about some of the work that I do. And, uh, and when I'd finished it afterwards, I said, so what do you think of it then, mum? And she said, you reminded me of Basil Fawlty. And I said, all right, why is that? And she said, well... It reminded her of a quote from Faulty Towers that she used to like, where he's having a row with Sybil, and during the row he turns to her and says, if you were to go and mastermind, your specialist subject would be the bleeding obvious. And uh, my mum said it reminded her of that Basil Faulty quote, because she said, it was all common sense what you were talking about. Brilliant. And I think that was a brilliant way of explaining it, that actually, and you'll know this, Dan, I think what we do is we often go in and try and just talk common sense, where it's not always common practice. And I think that's a great way of describing um, the world of, uh, of sports psych. I think that's so true. You know, there is a difference between there's a difference between knowing and doing, isn't there? I say I, I find myself saying that a lot because uh, I, whether it's a, a, a competitor, an athlete, or, or a coach, I often when I when I'm speaking to them and I'm going off on one, which I tend to do, they'll say, "Yeah, but I know that. But I know that. But I know that." And it's like observation or peer feedback has suggested to them that they don't actually do it. You know, yeah, as yeah. you put it there, it's the, the bleeding obvious, but then actually going and, and, and practicing the bleeding obvious. There's, there can be a big disparity between the two, can't there? Massively, massively. And that's why, uh, like, I always think of that in terms of my mum's feedback because she was coming at it without any sort of context other than it was just her son standing in front of a room explaining what 
I'd spent 14 years working towards and it was that idea that this is really simple and you get paid to talk about such simple concepts. Absolutely. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw my – after a uh, difference between knowing and doing, there's a difference between simple and easy. There's a difference between simple and easy. So, you know, it is simple, but it's not always easy to do. And, exactly and, like that. And, and talking about knowing and doing and simple and easy, uh, we're here to, um, you know, have our first conversation and, and, and celebrate your new book, um, The Barcelona Way, Unlocking the DNA of a Winning Culture. Um, which um, I've made my way through, and I, I have to say, mate, that um, you know, I, I when I, when I sit down and I read a book, I, I like to kind of skim it and speed read it, and 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 write some notes on it, and then if yeah. I want to, I, I kind of return back to some of the key points and make some more notes and stuff, and and this time I I I, I found myself. Um, going through it, through through it, skimming it, but stopping at certain p- points. You know, you really sucked me in to some of the points you were making, and I was like, "Damn you, Damien!" You know, I haven't got time to sit here and read this book in depth. You know, I've got to, I've got stuff to do. So, uh, oh, well, thank and, you, mate. That's a real compliment. No, well, I did, I did find myself sort of, sort of thinking, "Well, I want to be Damien Hughes when I grow up, when I'm a proper <laughs> sports psychology consultant," because this is an awesome book, and you, 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 you write with. Um, you know, as I say, it's 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 really interesting. It's it's it, it's it, it gets to the heart of um, where or how Barcelona got to where they wanted to get to, um, and talking about things that aren't obvious. Uh, actually, which kind of counters what we were talking about there. Actually, now I think <laughs> about it, it's, kind of, it's the stuff that's not actually that obvious. But you know, let me just say to the audience, you know. I'm going to give a brief outline of what's in the book and then we're going to talk through each bit. You talk about uh, the importance of having a commitment culture. You yeah. um, you compare that to having cultures of a star model, um, a, an engineering model, an, or, an autocratic model, a bureaucratic model. So we'll get, get you talking a little bit about that in a moment and then you break down uh, commitment culture into five areas, uh, big picture, uh, the arc of change, repetition, cultural architects, and authentic leadership. So we're going to talk about these uh, areas, but I wanted to start, I- I'm going to be quite selfish here, Damien, because oh. I'm passionate about, this, just as you are, the psychosocial side of um, coaching and, 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 and human performance. And, and um, by that, I mean, you know, I, I, I think coaches need to put the psych social side of coaching first. They drive the tech, the tactical, the physical sides of uh, the, oh, yeah. the game. And and I, I've picked out two quotes, two really interesting quotes from your book um, to demonstrate this. And these are these quotes are from two people who you would have thought of, who was who are so immersed in the technical tactical side of the game. Uh, firstly, um, Johan Cruyff, and sadly we're talking in past the past tense yeah. when it comes to Cruyff, but he said, "In order to be a coach of Barcelona, it's more important knowing how to lead a group of players than knowing how to correct a mistake made on the field." You have to influence or you have to have influence over the group to be able to seduce, convince and understand them. And the uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant quote. So so we talk about Cruyff in terms of technical, tactical, positional play, all the, 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 the great stuff there that he talks about. But. But but he's highlighting there as you as you write about in your book the importance of site social, and the second one, and I'll get you to comment on on this uh, cool. after I've said it, which is from Pep Guardiola himself. He says, "What I've learned over the years, um, I'm aware tactics are very important, but the really really great coaches are coaches of people." Perfect. Professor yeah. Damien Hughes, over to you on that one. <clears throat> well, I think you've highlighted a really powerful point there, Dan, in terms of that. I remember interviewing many years ago uh, Muhammad Ali's trainer, Angelo Dundee, 
and we were talking and I was and I kept referring to to fighters in our conversation and he stopped me and he said can I just remind you he said he said I coach people that happen to fight I don't coach fighters and it was that distinction that he was making about we it, it's about the social side of it like you say that um that is so important and I think we can get caught up in like you say when we talk about Crowe we talk about his positional awareness and and, and 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 the man's technical genius. Yep. But it's about the fact that people would follow him, and he knew how to that word seduce them uh, is really powerful. I mean, I'm often reminded. I um, I do this sometimes as an exercise with coaches uh, to highlight this like social element that you that I know you're emphasising here, and I know that is a key part of your work, Dan. That. I did this last year with um, with a group of players where I got them to divide up their best performance. We got them to talk about their best performance as a team. And then we divided it up really crudely into two areas. Now, I know you um, that, that there's more to this, but we spoke about the hard versus the soft skills. Yep. So in the language we're using here, so, so the tactical, technical, um, physical elements was the hard stuff. The soft stuff was about working together, communication, cohesion, things like that. And we got them to divide up how much of their best performance was hard and how much was soft. And we're talking about an elite team here when we did this, and and and, and the pattern is pretty consistent when I've done it with others, that it's never less than 70-30 in terms of the soft stuff. Yep. Everyone identifies it's around 70% of their best performance comes around that. The obvious next question is, well, let's have a look at where you spend most of your time in training. Yep. And the reality is it's 95% of it is spent doing the, doing the hard stuff. So my big question to any group is, well, how do you ever expect to get better? Because if you're telling me 70% of your, of your success is down to um, the social side of it, the soft stuff, and yet you do less than 5% of work a week, how do you ever expect to see any real significant gains and improvement? But it's a comfort zone for a lot of coaches. We go to where we're comfortable, get them in the gym, get them on the training ground, work them harder, rather than say, let's try and develop ourselves and let's step outside of that and let's just get the social glue of the group really, really strong. And it's nice when you find quotes from people that are often put out as paragons of their technical and tactical genius, like Guardiola, like Cruyff, to see that they recognise they're dealing with people first who just happen to be playing a particular sport. I, I, I think you've used this word comfort, and I, and I think that that's the thing. is it's, it's so much easier for a coach to sit down with a blank piece of paper and look forward to their training session in the evening or during the day, depending on the level and the age group they're coaching, and just think about the basic activities they're going to do. And what they don't do is they don't necessarily, and, that, and, that, and that's kind of the 30% that you're talking about as an approximate figure. And what they don't necessarily do is they don't think, they don't sit down with that blank bit of paper and maybe brainstorm, well, what are the soft skills that are going to be involved with these activities here? what's the yeah. communication piece what about my body language how do I speak to players where is the silence you know w- w- within my activities am I being directive am I being non-directive am I empowering players here how am I getting them to function better as a team and, 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 and I think it's because Damien, it, it's, 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 it's that comfort zone, isn't it? It's kind, of, it's, it's, it's kind of a bit easier to do that. And don't get me wrong, I understand there's a real art and a real skill and there's a real science behind great activities. And I understand that Pep Guardiola and uh, the other best coaches and coaches from all sports are great at designing really inventive, creative, tech, tactical activities. But there's an enormous psychosocial piece that envelopes those um that's tech tactical yeah. and it's coming out of comfort zone now, now this leads me on to your book because i i often think it's just that coaches it, it it's like they're shrugging their shoulders and they're saying well damien and dan how do we do that i'm an under eight so under 10s and under 12s and under 14s coach because you're still a coach of people 
young people like you still yeah. a coach of people how do i do that and 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 you have described this incredible club arguably that produced the best team of all time that sort of barcelona circa 2008 2012 if i'm kind of getting my dates right and, yeah, yeah. and, and, and the years after as well the best team of all time maybe you talk about a commitment culture um tell us a bit about uh, a commitment culture what does that consist of yeah, of course. Well, well, if we give you some context about why I chose Barcelona as well, yeah, because I think don't. because because I think that helps answer about if anybody's listening to this and thinking, yeah, but this is Barcelona. This is players that are really starred, and I'll, I'll explain why that needn't be a barrier to being able to implement the same ideas. Brilliant. So, so the idea behind it was that. Um, I spoke to a publisher who'd, who'd asked me if I'd be interested in writing a book on culture, because culture is one of these phrases that you often hear it banded around um, the, when you'll hear players talk about, oh, yeah, we've got a good culture at our club, and then, but nobody explains necessarily in too much detail. Well, what is culture? What does that mean? So the publisher had said to me, would, be interested in, if you, if, would you be interested in writing a book on culture? And I said, I'd love to do it. And then they accepted the challenge of saying, would you write a book around it through the lens of a sports organisation that, that have used culture as a competitive advantage? Now, that made it um, the field a lot narrower. So you start looking then at three teams that have, that have been very over in explaining how they have used this. So that takes you to the New Zealand rugby union team. You probably go to the New England Patriots. And then the final one is uh, Barcelona. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, the publisher said we'd be really interested uh, if you'd have a look at Barcelona. Mm. So what I then started to do was some research um, around this, and then I was fortunate enough to interview some of the architects behind it. So the context was that back in 2006, Barcelona won the European Cup under Frank Rijkaard, and they thought that they were set for a period of dominance. And then the year after, they fell away quite badly, and the club decided that Rijkaard had had earned their trust to get an extra year to see if he could turn it around, and they realised quite quickly in the August of that year of, of the of the season that things weren't going to happen. So they started the, the, the season by getting beat to um, Sevilla three nil in the Super Cup, and they realised then that the writing was on the wall. So rather than react to it in a panicky way, they decided to see the season out but use that season to really start to investigate what culture meant for them as a club. Now, the research around culture says that, effectively, it's how people behave in that organisation, what are the expectations around people behaving in a really simple way. Now, that's applied to any team, whether you're talking uh, an under eight team, whether you're talking about a professional team, it's what are the expectations of behaviour when people come in to, uh, to represent your organisation. So what they then did was... Um, there was two guys called Ferran Soriano and um, Chiki Bagiristain. One was the uh, was the chief executive. One of them was the uh, director of football. They looked at some research that had been done um, in Silicon Valley, um, which is which is the most comprehensive set of research around culture. And what this found was that when the group of people come together, there are five types of culture that tends to emerge. And I know you referenced them earlier, so. It's worth going through them. The first one is this idea of a star culture. So if you think of it in football terms, like Real Madrid, where they have a policy of you bring in the best players in the world every year, you give them the best facilities, um, and you hope that somehow that that talent will combine to produce spectacular results. Now, like Real Madrid in the last three years winning the Champions League, that can be really effective. But equally, when it goes wrong, it can be just as spectacular. So when they pursued that Galactico policy at the club there, they actually went through the longest barren period since the 1950s as well, when they still had Zidane and Beckham and um, Figo and all these other superstars playing for them. Mm. So the second type of culture then is an autocracy. And this is where it's dominated by one powerful individual. So if you think somewhere like Chelsea under Roman Abramovich, where they're currently on their 13th head coach, since he took over, where it's very much at the whim of them. I often think a really good example that's quite personal at the moment is you look at somewhere like Manchester United, yep. that, that was dominated by Ferguson for a long time, mm-hmm. taking him out of the equation, and you look at the confusion 
um, that follows that, but it was very much Ferguson's club. The third way you do it is you look at this idea of a bureaucracy, and this is where you have a committee that run it, and this is where it's dominated by rules and regulations and policies and procedures. So a really good example of this is probably what Liverpool have done in the last decade, where they've had this idea of a transfer committee. They have a six-man committee that makes decisions as to who gets signed and who gets sold, and the head coach is just one of those six voices. Now, although Liverpool have had a bit of success recently, it's still worth pointing out, since this transfer committee has been in place, they haven't won anything in the decade that that a group of people have been making these decisions. So, again, you're not making it through a cultural lens, you're making it through a statistical lens, very much like the money ball principles. The fourth way is um, the engineering culture, and this is where you bring in people that are technically brilliant at a particular job, and you put them all together and hope that they'll create a cumulative, cohesive group. So, again, a good example of that in football terms is probably what Wenger pursued at Arsenal in the last decade, where he's brought in a lot of technical specialists and hopes that if everybody does their job to the best of their ability they will be better than the sum of their parts. But it's the fifth culture that really interests us, which is around the commitment culture. And this is where the idea that the, uh, the culture is driven by a really clear sense of purpose. Everyone has a clear idea of what, of what you stand for. But then equally, they have a really clear set of behaviours that underpin it. These are the rules of membership to that group. And what they found, and, and this puts people very much at the heart of, of decision-making, And what they found in Silicon Valley was that a commitment model, if you look at this over a 25-year period, commitment cultures will always outperform the others. When you put people at the heart of this other business and, 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 and you make them central to it, similar to, again, your social model, yep. they will always outperform the others. So what Barcelona did was they said they were going, they said in a world where everybody tends to be as talented as each other and that talent equals out, culture can be a competitive advantage. So they decided they were going to pursue this. And that was, so they deliberately went after the commitment culture. And that was where the idea of, so the recruitment of Guardiola heralded the start of this commitment culture period. Now, if you look at Guardiola when they appointed him, he'd done one year's coaching experience at the B team uh, level at the club. So, On the five-man shortlist of the five different candidates they interviewed, four of those candidates had better, te- uh, had better technical, tactical um, exper- and, and, and knowledge and experience than what Guardiola did. So he, should, so he was the fifth candidate, if you view him, just through that lens. Sure. But if you view him through the cultural lens, his psych-social lens, Guardiola becomes a standout candidate despite his lack of experience so, because they felt he embodied everything that they wanted the culture to demonstrate. So if you notice that his very first press conference that he gives, he actually announces that the three star players that had been in the previous regimes um, uh, and and had been dominant characters, so Ronaldinho, Deco and Samuel Leto, at his very first press conference he announces that they will no longer have any part to play in the culture that he's creating at Barcelona. She makes a very clear statement of intent from that moment on. And then the next 10 years after he implements this, this is where it gets interesting, they win the league eight out of 10 times, they win three Champions Leagues, and they win the World Club Challenge, uh, Club uh, Championship three times in that same period. So what the book looks for is, so not why did they do this, or it, it's more around what were the principles that underpinned this this golden age for them and that's the idea that hopefully anybody that reads the book regardless of of um their level of coaching mm. the group they're coaching they could take something away from it and still implement some of the same principles you see i, I it's really interesting and 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 uh, i think the first thing to say and, and and you say this in the book is that Um, those other, you know, the star uh, model, the engineering, the autocratic, the bureaucratic, you know, they can have some success, can't they, for a period of time, but uh, they don't necessarily have sustainability. So, you know, a star model can win a trophy in a given season. Maybe it can win two or three trophies. As you alluded to, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson at Manchester United, that was quite the autocratic model with 
you know, the greatest of respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and he had that enormous... But when you look at it from a wider lens, maybe over maybe a 50-year lens, if that's what you choose to use it over, and Ferguson was there for, what, 22, 25 years, however long it was... Um, because that there was that autocracy, there really needed to be an outstanding handover. And yeah. whether there was, whether there wasn't, I'm certainly not on a podcast going to start criticising Sir Alex Ferguson. He is Sir Alex Ferguson. He is, you know, a, a, was it was it was a genius manager. Um, but it, it, there hasn't necessarily been that smooth handover. Uh, style of performance and outcomes have suggested so. So that autocratic model, ha- you know, doesn't necessarily work for a real long period of time. So yeah. those other, other models can work, but it is about having that commitment model that can be more sustainable, can't it? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and a great example of it is you look at Real Madrid winning three Champions Leagues on the bounds. Mm. Pursuing this star model, like you say, it works, but then it's interesting that you look at Zidane and the reasons that he stated for stepping down from that, that he didn't feel it was sustainable, right. didn't feel the club was set up to go on and deliver continued success. He felt that that golden period, that cycle, yep. was uh, was at an end. Right. So, it's, so it's often cited within sport that a team will have a cycle of a maximum of, of four years before... Um, decline or starts to set in. So you look at Barcelona in that same period and they've gone 10 years. So they've done two and a half cycles, which gives you an idea of the, the principles of this commitment culture can set you up for a longer period of sustainable success. And, and, and I think what we're describing here makes this actually more relevant and more tangible for under 12s, under 14s, 16s coaches, college coaches, because it, it's not like at that level, and, and college may be slightly different here, but it's not like at that level that you're after the trophy um, necessarily. It, it, it's even more important at those age groups to build that sustainable culture, you know, around yourself, your, co- your fellow coaching staff, volunteers who are involved in your project program or at your club you know when you put people at the heart of what you do rather than the x's and the o's and when you you know within my psych social model and i'm i've unashamedly talked about this on my previous two podcasts is in my psych social model there's three p's participation progression and performance and i think every coach is invested in these three things but i point yes. actually what what coaches don't necessarily appreciate is that participation piece is that every single coach whether you're jürgen klopp pep guardiola or whether you're the local under 10s under 12 coach whether you're college coach at N- ncaa division one level you are involved in participation because you you have to drive engagement within your program. You've yeah. got to help players want to show whether because, you know, it's fun for them at eight years old, whether it's because you make movement fun and challenging at 10 years old, whether it's because you engage them in styles of coaching that helps them learn uh, skill at under 12s, under 13s, but you do so in, in a manner that helps them, in, helps them engage in your program or whether it's you get buy-in from 20-year-old, 21-year-old players at, at, at under, you know, at, 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 in, within development squads at Premier League level or in college squads. Um, that participation piece is so important. You've got to engage your players, and it's the same for Pep Guardiola. Yeah, definitely. And I, and, and, and I know that that's a big emphasis in terms of your academy work that do, that uh, that you do Dan and and I know the other podcasts that you've mentioned on it and and I wouldn't apologize for keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it because because it has to lie at the very heart of what it is that we're doing and if you are a coach um I mean I was fortunate that I grew up as the son of a of a coach so my dad was a boxing coach um in um in um, it's classed as Europe's third poorest district, but it was a poor area of Manchester. So I grew up in um, in in this sporting environment where I saw my dad sort of take guys that had come into uh, into this world, and he took five lads to sort of world titles and things like that. Wow. But in January of this year, 
We were really fortunate. Manchester Council named a road after him in the area for the impact and the legacy of the work that he did. And what was really interesting was the amount of people that turned up that have never laced on a pair of boxing gloves since they first came in as young people, but they came in to pay tribute to the impact that it had on their lives in terms of it made them understand just by participating, it made them understand that they could go further than what they necessarily believed or they could overcome mental hurdles that, that, that had previously seemed beyond them. And it was that social impact on their life that the nature of his work had had that really emphasised for me that that's the most satisfying bit of coaching. It's about getting, about getting people to be better people and to understand how they can take the lessons that they might learn in your coaching session at under eights to how they can interact with adults when they go into that world of work for the first time or things like that. So you're absolutely right. I think putting this at the very heart of coaching is is an essential skill. It, it, it It's the bedrock of which everything else can come from. And, and, and you know, last thing to say on, on this little bit before we put more meat on the bone um, about the kind of the, 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 the philosophies and tools and techniques within that commitment culture, but um, to, to, to labour the point on purpose here, to emphasise the point, you know, your, 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 your father's work from a psychosocial perspective, the coaching of people within that, that gym, gymnasium, um, drove, I guess, the, the the technical, tactical side of boxing. He helped them be better technicians within the ring um, by helping them be better people. And this is what I try to, because often you get back from from coaches, and perhaps quite rightly to challenge my own notion of this is, yeah, but yeah, but Dan players still need to be good you know technically or need to develop skill or need to have a greater understanding of the game but they won't you won't help them to do that unless you can you can engage them and that's what Guardiola said I'll give you a brilliant I'll give you a brilliant example of it yeah. Dan, that, yeah. that a few years ago I, I did a, um, a biography of a great boxer a guy called uh, Thomas uh, I did one of Thomas Hearns and I did one of Marvin Hagler Marvelous so Marvin doing, Hagler yeah and Hitman Marvelous Hearns. Marvin Hitman yeah Hearns, so yeah. Um, so I did the biographies of them. So going out there, um, when I was doing the Hearns one, I had to go out to Detroit uh, to go and interview Hearns and a lot of the people that had sort of grown up around him. And um, I was fortunate to go to a, a, a world-famous gym called the Cronk Gym. And um, the experience of going there was, I'm not going to dress it up, it was intimidating. So I, I was... I'll give you an example. I was the only white guy in a, like a five mile radius of this of this neighborhood, so I stood out physically. And then, um, just in terms of what I saw in terms of the violence and the gangs and the guns and things like that, were quite intimidating. And when I got into this particular gym, I'm, I met the head coach, who unfortunately has passed away now, but he was a guy called Emmanuel Stewart. Yep, yep. And when I got up to meet him, um, his first question to me when I arrived in his gym was, he said, Damien, it's great to see you. He said, how do you feel coming here this morning to the famous Cronk gym? And I thought he was being polite, so I gave him a polite response. I said, oh, it's a real honour to be here. I've been really looking forward to meeting you, Manny. And I went through the motions, and then he said, that's really kind. He said, now would you mind telling me the truth, how you really feel? <laughs> right. And that one question just took the, took the veil away, and I found myself gibbering away, saying to him, oh, you know, to be honest... Manny, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous and I know you're busy and I don't want to waste your time and some of the stuff I've seen. And he put his arm on my shoulder and he said, he said, thank you for being honest with me. He said, me and you are now going to do some really good work together. And when I got to know him over the preceding months, I went back to that first meeting and I said, what did you do that morning? Said, Why did you ask that question? And he said, well, he said, I sense you were being polite. He said, it was two answers. He said, the first question I asked, how did you feel, was designed to find out two things. He said, your first answer told me, told me two things. You're either a liar or a sociopath. He said, you're either lying to reply or you really are a sociopath. So I need to know who I'm dealing with. He said, and then once you told me the truth, he said, I realized that you would just be implied to me. And he said, and that's where he said, we, I could then proceed on that basis. But this is the key bit. He said, every child that comes into my world feels the same way you do. They feel nervous. They feel intimidated. They feel a little bit out of the depth. And he said, I think I'm the best coach in the world, technically. He said, but I know I can't coach you 
if that's how those, if those feelings are clouding your emotion. He said, if, if your thinking is clouded by worried about feeling out of your depth or worried that I want to make you look stupid or you're nervous, I can't give you the technical knowledge that you need to get better. So he used a lovely phrase that I think sums up this, this psych social model where he said, I work on the basis that you contain and then explain. And the contain bit is he said, I need to make you understand that I care for you. I'm interested in you as a person, that I'm invested in your success, that I know a bit about your, your story. And once you convinced that you're safe in my company, that you can trust me, then I can start to explain how to get better technically. And I think that principle of that quote back from quote from Croy for from Guardiola is a great articulation of the money steward view of it's about containing before you try to explain how they're going to take up their tactical positions or how technically they're going to start to spot space. A fantastic story and sort of neatly segues me into the five areas that you you break that commitment culture down into and that the first area is the big picture um tell us a little bit about that um yeah of course at, yeah whether it's at barcelona or other clubs or whatever what's the what's the big picture damien well the big picture is very much around the why the what and the how so this is about setting out a blueprint to say well why do we do this in the first place so again if you're if you're leading a junior football club and you're listening to this it might be well why do you do this and it might be about you do it to get kids off the street you do it to 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 enjoy each other's company it could be something like that at barcelona theirs is from more a, a social and political standpoint they say we're more than a club so we represent the very best of catalonia to the rest of the world so they're driven by a really clear sense of purpose the second thing is then about so how do we do that so what does that look like mm. and that's very much around this is where Cruyff came in and laid down a blueprint about how they were going to play they were going to play uh, exciting football so they were going to play it where they felt they had the chance to entertain themselves and each other so one of Cruyff's points was he said why would you want to play boring football and if you didn't win the league at the end of that season you've lost on both counts so you've not enjoyed watching it and you didn't achieve what you wanted to do anyway mm. so it was very much around what that looks like and that's very much about developing their own talent but it's the third bit that I think is most pertinent to anybody listening to this from a coaching point of view which is the how are we going to do this and this is where you lay down really clear behaviours. The phrase I use when I work with teams is talk about trademark behaviours. What are the behaviours that are non-negotiable, that, are, that you can almost trademark as, you wouldn't be a part of this team, this organisation. What are the behaviours that everybody needs to understand? Now, I draw a key distinction here, Dan, because I often hear teams talk about our values. And I think values is too abstract. Okay. Because because people don't ever have to demonstrate their values. They can say that they that they believe them without ever having to actually put their neck on the line and demonstrate them. So take a really silly example, but somebody might believe in diversity and say, oh, yeah, that's a really important value. But you might be a closet racist. And, and the reality is you could tell people that you believe in diversity, but the only way we can ever tell whether you really do is to watch how you behave towards other people. Mm. And if you behave in a discriminatory way, you don't believe what you uh, what you profess. So the easiest way is talk about it in behavioural terms. Talk about it in behaviours because you can see behaviours and therefore you can observe them and feed back on them. So talk about behaviours rather than values because people can't hide them. And then the second principle is don't have any more than three. By the nature of being selective on this and being... And, and being clear about it. Three behaviours is enough for anybody. So at Barcelona, what they identified, their three behaviours that they wanted to stand for at the club was three. So the first one was humility. Because the point was, um, they said, by the time you reach our dressing room door, you're gonna, the chances are you're going to be a multimillionaire, highly fated footballer. But if you start to come here with the status symbols of your success or your wealth, there's a good indication that you've stopped learning. Humility is the bedrock of learning and getting better. So humility is the first behavior that they demand. The second behavior is hard work. So their point was, they said, by the time you reach us, you've worked hard to get here. That isn't the end. It's merely the end of the beginning. You continue that hard work to improve. 
And then the third behavior is if you're ever in a situation where there is a clash between what might be right for you personally versus what is right for the team, choose what's right for the team every time. And they're really clear about demanding those three behaviors are what. There's a great quote from Cheeky Beginnerstein, who was the director of football that he gave me, where he said, your talent will get you as far as our dressing room door. How you choose to behave decides whether we'll keep you in that dressing room. Which goes back to that point you were talking about there around around that psych social model. Talent has to be a prerequisite. You have to be good enough to be in that environment, first of all. So that's Absolutely. not to discount that. So this isn't about saying, oh, just being a nice bloke is enough. It's not. Absolutely. You have to be a good... Talent gets you that far. But then it's around how you choose to commit to those behaviours. So they had some great examples of it at Barcelona of what that looks like. So, so, so once you've demanded those behaviours, you start finding stories that almost embody it. So the great example they use is um, Cater, uh, the midfielder. Yep. That in the 2009 Champions League final, uh, he wasn't going to play and then they got some injuries and the only way he was going to get in the team was he was going to have to play as a right, as a right fullback. And he went to Guardiola and said to him, do not play me as a right fullback. And he said, because I know that there are better alternatives to me playing there than you picking me. Now, he knew that by going and having that conversation, he wasn't going to even make the bench of the final. But he put the team above his own self-interest of being a member of it. Wow. So Guardiola uses that as a great example of when, of that's what that behaviour really looks like. Don't come in here. So he, he, he employed a guy called Manel SDR, who was a water polo player, as his assistant. Okay. And one of the tasks that he gave uh, SDR was to simply watch the bench. So once he'd communicated these behaviours, one of the tasks was, during games, Guardiola said, don't you worry about the game. I'll take care of that bit. What I want you to do is watch the people. And his job was, during the game, if there was a chance that went wide... He said, have a look at the bench and I want you to tell me who reacts in empathy of like holding the head because the chance has just been missed versus who are the players that sit where, there with their arms crossed, uninterested. Because what that would tell me in behavioural terms is they're sulking because they're not in the team. So they're putting their self-interest above the team's interest. And they look for patterns of behaviour like that. And once he found a consistent, who were the players that consistently sulked on the bench because they weren't selected? Eventually, they weeded them out and just asked them to go and find a different club because they said, we've been really clear about how you, how your membership of the dressing room um, is, uh, of, 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 of how that depends. And your behaviour indicates that you're not signing up and subscribing to these behaviours. So their point was, they said, it doesn't matter how talented you might be as a player, if you're not prepared to marry your talent to those behaviours, the culture can't, can't accommodate you. So what, what I hear you saying there, I mean, b- brilliant stuff, amazing story from Cater there and, and, you know, the sacrifice he made. And, and w- w- what I hear you saying is, you know, there's an obsession with the right behaviours. There's that, here's our big picture. This is what we want to achieve and this is why we want to achieve it. So in Barcelona's terms, it's a Catalonian thing. It's, it's, it's more than a club. So we, this is what we want to achieve, whether it's being the best club in the world, it's winning the Champions League. This is why we want to achieve it. So it's the what, it's the why. And then the how is the kind of the the, I'm going to use that word obsession. It's pro- possibly the wrong word, but that obsession with the right behaviours. You know, we, we think of Guardiola so synonymous with obsession with tactics, which he probably is. He probably is, but he, he is also obsessed with the kind of behaviours that are congruent with our what and our why. And, and, and yeah. interestingly, listening to you there, Damien, I'm almost thinking, you know, if there's players listening to this podcast, you can have your own mini big picture. You know, and I work on this with players all the time, is, is what do you want to achieve? Why do you want to achieve that? That why is your fuel, your fire, if you, or, or, or the fuel, sorry, that lights the fire. And then the, yeah. the how, well, there's lots of things we can talk about, but it is that obsession with am I engaging in the right behaviours every single day and for a coach it's asking yourself am I creating the culture and the environment that helps players engage in those right behaviours to get where they want to go yeah so I'll give you a really good example of it I remember doing some work with one coach and I was saying to him 
everything is coachable. Every opportunity is coachable. It's, you don't have to be on the field to feel that you're a coach. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, so I took him once when um, the players uh, went in the canteen. So we'd gone to an external location and the players were in a canteen. And I said to him, come with me and we'll stand at the end of the food queue. And he said, why? And I said, let's watch for the players that just fill up their play without any regard to the fact that there might be 20 other guys stood behind them. So who are the guys that just load it on as much as they possibly can without making sure that they're teammates? Because that gives you the chance. If you've communicated that you be a team player and you see somebody just being selfish in their eating patterns and not caring that there might not be enough food for everybody else, coach them at that moment. Make them aware that that's a behaviour that's unacceptable within your culture. You know, and, 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 and again, I've done it with... But everything has to be preceded by you have to communicate the behaviours before you can then start to, to, to catch people in and catch them out. So I remember doing some work with the, with the team in the, the Premier League a few years ago where we'd spoken about this idea of uh, we stuck together. So our behaviour was we were, uh, th- that we would remain united. And what that allowed us to do was then challenge behaviours that, like, one of my pet hates is seeing players berating a teammate, really, uh, and remonstrating with them publicly. Yeah. Now, unless we'd agreed that the behaviour that, w- that, that got you in our dressing room was being united, when we saw that behaviour, we could have a conversation with a player that did that to say, that's unacceptable. Now, if you, cho- if you choose to do that again, we'll have to find somebody, there are plenty of alternatives we have to replace you. And the player quickly recognised, went, yeah, you're right, okay, we'll do something about it. So there's lots of ways in which you can coach them both on and off the field, but you have to understand what the behaviours are and communicate it before you can have those conversations. Yeah, and, 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 and as, as you're talking now, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, some of the stories I've heard about Pochettino at Spurs and, and his fastidious attention to the, the many behaviours around the training ground, you know, right the way down to the body language of the, the, the players, you know, in the corridor. I think sometimes these things are talked about, maybe that there's, there's a slight myth to them or whatever, but that's what I've heard. And actually I have found you know first hand that uh, somebody who worked with him you know she said that, that that Pochettino would suddenly turn up in the room and and to monitor adherence that the players were where they should be and and it wasn't so much to, it wasn't micromanagement because he wasn't doing that all the time but it was just you know it might be once a month it might be once a fortnight but it was just letting those players know that uh, just saying look I, I, I'm looking at the, for the appropriate behaviors here because those appropriate behaviors are going to help you be the very best you can be when we're at our best like there's a phrase i sometimes use when i talk about success leaves clues so come at it from that point of view and say when we're at our best how do we behave when we're at, when when we're in that state and get the players to start identifying what that looks like in behavioral terms and it might be and it'll be unique to every culture but some might say we have a good laugh with each other or you know, we spend time in each other's company afterwards. And you start to identify some of the traits of what that looks like. And then from that, you nail down which are the most important ones that we can do and that, we, that, that we're not going to compromise on. And it might be that, like, with a younger age, it might be that I don't like it when my teammates shout at me when I make a mistake. So what do we like instead? Well, we like it when we get encouragement after a mistake. So you make that part of your trademark behaviours, that we encourage each other constantly. So that way, like one of my pet hates is gimmickry, where you get play, where you'll get some coaches and they'll come in and do something for a short period of time, and everyone goes, "Oh, this is a new gimmick." What this allows you to do is get away from gimmickry and make it a regular part of what players and staff and everyone else can expect in that environment. And I think for a young coach, you can still do this, but I would come at it from the success leaves clues approach when we're good. What do we behave like when we're good? So how do we keep demonstrating these behaviours? Fantastic. And, and so on to the, ne- the next one, which is arc of change. Arc of change. Tell us a little bit of it. So we've got the big picture in place. What's the arc of change? Yeah, so this is um, basically about how, so how do you deal with um, the journey? Because we have this sense that, we'll put these ideas in place and then we'll be successful. And you know as well as I do that that never does happen. So change follows a particular pattern. 
So we understand this. So again, it comes back to that point we made at the start of this discussion then, knowing versus doing. So we, so we know this and yet doing it um, provides us with real issues. So I like quoting a stat that say 98.1% of people that go to diet clubs in the UK are the same weight or heavier 12 months later. And you go, well, how can that be the case? And you go, well, like Billy Connolly uh, summed up about losing weight years ago, where he said you can describe it in, two, in four words, eat less, move more. But So that's the essence of it. Do more exercise and just eat and, and consume less calories. So, so we know that, but then doing it becomes difficult. And the reason is because we turn up at diet clubs and we have this idea of, oh, yeah, I'll, the, 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 um, we always focus on the outcome that you'll have lost weight, you'll feel great, you'll be on the beach in the summer and, and things feel great. It's in the bit of the journey where we often get uh, destabilized. So the arc of change says, how do you cope for those moments? So it's like, if you think about the worst time to go food shopping is when you're hungry. Because when you walk in that supermarket, you can't think about the, about what you're going to eat for the next week. You only think about the next five minutes and getting through that. So this says... Before you start the journey, let's work out what are the kind of things on that arc of change that can stop us. So there's five stages to the arc of change that, that, that you can identify, and you can almost use this as a roadmap. So this comes from the work of Joseph Campbell, who was an anthropologist that looked at how all human cultures over history have told stories, because stories involve around movement, and, and change involves moving from one state to another. So the five stages are, first of all, we have to be able to articulate it, the dream state, and that's the why, the what, and the how, the big picture stuff. Then we have to make some kind of commitment towards it, a leap of commitment, a leap of faith that says, I'm going to be a part of this. It's the third bit, though, that gets really interesting. It's called the messy middle. This is the bit where you get far enough in that you can't go back, but you're not far enough to get to the end of it. So there's a, there's a phrase from... Um, there's a Harvard professor, a lady called Ross Cancer, that, is, that has the law made after it, Cancer's Law, that says in the middle of any project, it will always look or feel like a failure. So this is the bit where if you can identify before you get to this stage, what are the kind of things that might derail us? So at Barcelona, they sat down and said, right, what if we lose games? What if um, the media pressure uh, starts to become really intense? What if some players stop by an inter? the way of doing it. They identified some of the obstacles that might come their way. And then when they're not facing those obstacles, when they're calm and they know what to do, as opposed to having to do it, they identified what they were going to do and what their and what their plans of how they would address those moments would look like. So that gave them a way of navigating their way through the messy middle because once you get through that stage you will start to see signs of progress, which is the fourth stage. Before the fifth stage is you'll arrive at the state where you want to get to. So the arc of change just says, so anyone could do this if you were listening to it, when you, maybe at the start of a season when you're planning the season, you look at some of the things that might go wrong during that season and how are you going to handle those moments of crisis. And if you can just, just by simply identifying what those problems are, research indicates you become around 33% more resilient in the face of those challenges because you've already gone through the mental process of anticipating them and giving yourself some degree of, um, of, of, of um, action and response to them. So the arc of change just says around, this won't go smoothly, so don't kid yourself it will. It will get difficult, so you need to know how you're going to handle those moments. You know, Damien, it, what you're talking about reminds me of the work of uh, Gabriel uh, Attingen. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My apologies to her if I'm not, who's a, a German um, psychologist uh, working in the States, and her work is on goal setting, and, and she talks oh, yeah. a, a lot about um, well, she, her research has investigated the importance of actually, rather than just setting a goal and saying, yep, this is, you know, I'm going to give up smoking, and this is great, and I'm going to do it, and, and, yeah. and just, you know, I'm, I'm going to limit drinking, and, and all the things you might set goals around uh, sort of maladaptive behaviors talking about there um it's actually uh, m uh people who actually f see their goals through succeed are ones who look realistically 
at that process and think about what they're going to do, how it creates strategies uh, when they become, if they're trying to lose weight, weight, when they become hungry and they want to reach for that packet of biscuits, when they really want to have a drink or a cigarette or something like that. So again, talking about maladaptive behaviours that they might want to improve if we can describe them as maladaptive behaviours. But, um, you know, I, I think that, that what you're talking about reminds me of her work. And I, I think that's so relevant. It's some, something that is so often ignored within the coaching community and it's so relevant for younger uh, age groups as well I think you know uh, uh, again an under 16 or an under 14 coach can talk with players about well we've got this upcoming game what are we going to do if we go a goal down how are we going to react yeah. and respond? You know, what are, what are you going to do, Joe Bloggs or, or, or Mary Smith, if um, if you make a couple of mistakes in the first 10 minutes and you feel a bit lethargic and flat-footed? What are you going to do to put that right? How can I help you put that right? How can I be involved? How can your teammates be involved? And, you know, you could even pinpoint that down to an actual specific, you know, training session, a coaching session. At the beginning of a session, spend the first minute, you know, rather than just letting players warm up and do their SAQ stuff actually say you know what there may be a time during this coaching session today where you do a few things wrong how are you going to react and respond what am I going to see you do maybe with your body language or helping each other out I I, I like your acronym for that Dan your jam bam that you talk about just a minute and body action and movement and and, yeah, so I, I, again, that's where I would tie in some of the work that, that you do with that. Just asking that question has a significant impact of, you know, things go wrong, follow it up with your question of what's the jam bam? Yeah. And, and, and get them to think about that. And, and what all the research, again, like you're talking about uh, Gabrielle's work or, or some of the other stuff around yeah. this is your resilience automatically increases just by thinking about that. But, but, I hear a lot of coaches, they get into this idea of, it, 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 so they almost sort of misinterpret positive psychology principles and yes. that you're not allowed to talk about failure because it almost pre, uh, it preempts it. And it's like, no, that's exactly the point, that positive psychology isn't believing everything's going to be great. It's actually anticipating that things won't be great and how you're going to handle those moments well i wrote about this yesterday i do a a, a mini message on linkedin every morning and um uh, monday to friday and uh, i take a break at the weekend damien and uh, I, <laughs> I wrote yesterday i wrote about just exactly that is that people confuse me for being the positive the the, the positive thinking guy you know and i, I and i'm not I, if, if, if i'm going to pigeonhole myself if i'm going to describe myself it's the flexible thinking guy because that's really? what i find yeah no it, it, it it's being flexible on on that whether it's optimism pessimism scale whether it's helpful unhelpful constructive uh, destructive whether it's positive negative scale however you want to describe that scale it's just being able to be flexible up and down behaviorally thinking wise affects or emotion that that that's how I see my role is co-creating solutions with players and coaches to deliver flexibility you know so it's, it's so important and let's move on now let's talk about being flexible let's move on now to the next uh, one which is repetition repetition and, and I think that it's repetition isn't it of um, re- recurring systems and processes yeah so I, I, I started this chapter by looking at uh, the work of Xavi at Barcelona mm. and the reason is that everybody talks about Xavi as, as a fundamental part of this period of their success mm. but what really interested me when I was doing the research was the club tried to get rid of him twice and they tried to sell him the year before Guardiola came in and they'd also tried to do it earlier. So it's like, if this guy is so fundamental, how did they nearly lose him by their own volition on two occasions? And the answer is because in their processes, so I explain around it's around the fundamental attribution error. So they were judging Xavi by the wrong criteria or an unhelpful criteria. So if you were looking for powerful, e, um, high ego characters that made it all around them, mm. he's the wrong guy for you. Mm. So if they were, if they were, so they were valuing the wrong characteristics. But if you were valuing humility, hard work, and somebody that puts the team first, that's how he suddenly goes from an outsider to being integral to the success of the club. So 
then you need to so so it comes back to the behaviors the trademark behaviors before you then start to say so how do you measure this on a daily basis so what they did was and again this is a really easy way for coaches listening to this to think about how they do it think about the most effective speeding deterrents so the most effective way that you get people to comply with the laws of wherever you live when you're driving are not people are not policemen trying to catch you with speed guns or not setting speed traps up for you the most effective way of speeding of getting people to comply is about giving people those radar displays where you flash the speed up of the driver and then you do the happy or the smiley face uh, on the back of it yep and what the research says is when so when you go through one of those radar displays you're likely to comply with the speed limit for around seven miles longer than if it's just a cop trying to catch you out with it wow because what you're doing is you're creating an environment that is basically a huge feedback. You're creating a feedback loop of, of, uh, um, around it. So you're giving people – so first of all, you're capturing evidence. So you're saying you're driving too fast. The relevance of that message is that you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else. The consequence is that, apart from those injuries, that – that the law of the land will catch you out eventually if you keep driving too fast. So you then have a, have a choice to adapt your behavior or ignore it. And if you can create an environment that is almost like a constant feedback loop, once you have these behaviors in place, you avoid the gimmicks that we spoke about earlier, but people will naturally start to comply and, and adapt their behaviors accordingly. So if you say, for example, that the, the, that one of the behaviours is... So, again, go back to Barcelona and say humility, hard work, and putting the team first. That was why they put a feedback loop in place about players that turned up late for training. So you had to sign in the visitor's book, and when you signed in the visit uh, the book to indicate what time you arrived at training, they also got you to identify some questions around how you felt that day around the day's training. But if you were late for training... They would address it very, very quickly. They wouldn't turn a blind eye to it and say, oh, that's just him. They would address it because they said, first of all, you're you're putting your own self-interest above the team. You think you're more important than the rest of your teammates that are doing it. So then it becomes a, a way of giving people that immediate feedback yeah. rather than allowing that resentment to, uh, to be stored up and to get annoyed about it that comes out in an explosion of anger. You're giving people the ability to adapt their behaviour in real time rather than just expect that they'll pick up the message by giving them a, a glare or being annoyed at them but never actually telling them. You've created an environment to do precisely that. So this idea of, again, if, if you were listening to this as a coach, you'd say, so does your environment allow you to give these, to create this constant feedback loop for it? So when players are coming into the environment, do you have something that would indicate that they know whether they're on track or off track in terms of what it is that they're doing and how they should be behaving. So the example I gave earlier about with that coach mm. around it, um, stand at the end of the food queue and watch to see who are the players that, I mean, you could look at who are the players that don't move their plates away? Who are the players that expect that somebody else will come and tidy up after them? So, like... I know that the All Blacks often get cited about their sweep the sheds message around cleaning the dressing room. And I, and I hear a lot of teams do that, but it always seems like as a gimmick why they do it. And they do it because they've heard that the All Blacks do it. Yeah. But, if you, but if you've got a really clear behaviour that, that of respect, yeah. and that respect is what's understood, that becomes obvious why you would tidy the dressing room up afterwards, because that's what you've demanded. You've not just done it because the old blacks do it. You've done it because that's a behavior yeah. that goes all the way through your organization. Yeah. So again, I'd encourage coaches. I mean, we develop what's often called a, sc- a scotoma. We become blind to what we do every day. Yeah. So, th- th- so Seth Godin, the marketeer, talks about sheepwalking. So we often sheepwalk our way through a day and don't think about it. But when you have these behaviors, and if you're a coach, walk through your day. Walk through it and try and view it through the eyes of, Maybe a player could view it through the eyes of a parent, view it through the eyes of a fellow coach and have a look to see where you can build these feedback loops in, where you can get people to demonstrate certain behaviours that you can feed back on and, that, and aim to catch people in as well as catch them out 
and get them to decide to comply with what's expected. And, and in that way, you are, are managing the environment to manage player behaviour, aren't you? And, and, and um, something that you, you know, talk about sleepwalking through your day and, 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 and not necessarily, ref, you know, checking in or reflecting back on, on, on your coaching culture, your coaching environment. Something you speak about in that chapter is the, the fundamental attribution error. Um, from Stanford psychologist Lee Ross, you know, and yeah. that tendency to, you know, we, we we tend to look at people within our coaching group and say, this is the way that person is. He or she brings this to the table and that's a problem. Rather than actually thinking, okay, this is the way this player is behaving. Now, what is it about my culture or the environment um, that is influencing that behavior? That's creating that behavior or that is expanding or blowing up that behavior? And I, I, I like what you talk about there, that the fundamental attribution error, that it's an attribution error that actually that person's behavior is more because of what you're doing as a coach or group of coaches than what that person brings to the table and and i like that there's a quote i've taken out that you say let's spend more time as coaches observing character and building character than judging talent yes exactly so again a really good way of sometimes uh, that i try and explain it sometimes is say we're really good at judging people by behaviors but then we judge ourselves by our intention Okay, so, yeah. so, so when you're driving a car and somebody cuts you up, you go, "What a dick!" Whereas when you cut somebody up, it's because you're in a rush. Mm. So, it's, so again, that if we can view it through this idea of let's let's judge how people behave, mm. how do they integrate to the group? Are they the ones that that like? I remember interviewing many years ago Alex Ferguson, mm. and um, we were talking at the time. Danny Welbeck was emerging mm. uh, as um, as a young player that he was given the chance to at the team, and I remember asking him why um, why he was prepared to persist with Welbeck when there was other strikers that were seen as just as talented that the club had let go. So they had an Italian guy called Rossi that they'd sent out on loan at the same time. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ferguson's answer gives you a brilliant example of this very point. He said, the reason we've persisted with Danny is he said, because he's the only player that stays behind to help the coaches collect the balls after training. And he said, and you know, the other thing is, he said, he always goes for the most difficult balls, the ones that have landed in a hedge or the ones that are furthest away. And I said, well, so what does that tell you? And he said, well, look at what that indicates about him. He's a guy that cares about other people. He's prepared to go the extra mile. He's prepared to take responsibility. He's been involved in the shooting practice and he's still prepared to go and gather the balls. And he said, so who wouldn't want somebody like that, a character like that within their team? Who wouldn't want somebody that's going to contribute to that. He said, well, because they're all as fit and as fast and as talented as each other. So now it comes down to character as much as their talent, which again, you've got to the, uh, the quote from Cheeky Bagheera staying in the book, your talent gets you to the dressing room door. Your behavior decides if we're going to allow you to stay in there. Yeah. And that, that's such a big lesson for, for players, players who are listening into this podcast is that, you know, you don't, you know, you really do have to take the attitude that there are there there are eyes watching you do everything. You know, and 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 your attitude will will make such a big difference to the decisions that coaches make. Uh, whether that's your college coach, your your high school coach, whether that's your professional club coach, if that's the level you're 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 competing at, is that the the, the coaches will watch you, and the best ones will look towards attitude and character um, over and above ability. For me, um, Damien, it, there, there's clearly there are there are clearly, and I'm probably talking more individual sports here. There are clearly sports competitors who have so much skill in their hands or their feet that they can kind of get away with some quirky uh, mannerisms um, and, and behaviours. Yeah. Um, but in team sports, more and more as, as, as managers and coaches start to understand 
culture and environment and people skills more and more, then you can have all the talent in the world. But if you're not the one who's collecting the balls, if you're if 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 you're not behaving in a way that isn't going to help the club, isn't going to help the team, then it doesn't matter how much skill you've got in your foot or your hands or whatever sport you're playing in that's relevant. Um, you you might not get chosen. You might not yeah, get exactly. chosen. You know, and it's so important. And I mean, and, there's a lovely story on that yeah. about about the quirkiness. That again, that, that when people talk about Ferguson and they talk about him at United, and they say, "Yeah, yeah let Cantona get away with a lot." And there's a great story Roy Keane tells, and I, I, I put it in the Barcelona book about so um, about many years ago when the players had a pool uh, at Manchester United where they, so they'd recorded a video and they all got about 200 quid's worth of royalties and the players said this isn't worth collecting the 200 quid so they agreed to pool it together into a pot and they said we'll draw one name out of it so whoever wins it gets like £10,000 so it becomes significant and the young players they allowed them to opt out because they said 200 quid is still significant for you and out of the young players, two of them, Nicky Butt and Paul Scholes, said, no, no, we wouldn't be in the pot. We wouldn't have a chance of winning. And the person that got picked out was Cantona. And Keane tells the story that everybody berated Cantona of, oh, typical, uh, it would happen to you. But they said the next day when Cantona came into training, he called Scholes and Nicky Butt over to them and he gave them each a cheque for £5,000 each. Wow. The point he made to them was he said, I like the fact that you were prepared to win that you were prepared to gamble to actually win this. You didn't just take what you had. You were prepared to gamble to win big. And he said, and that's the attitude that will serve you well in your career. So it's a great example of, I don't want to get onto a bit of cultural architects, yep. but Cantona was allowed, was indulged to a certain degree yep. because he embodied the behaviours that were non-negotiable in that club, that idea of being a team player, but also being somebody that was prepared to gamble to win big so that was why you can allow certain quirkiness of players within a culture as long as they're prepared to adhere to the trademark behaviors that everybody else has agreed to sign up to as well well and, and you know let, let's move on to cultural architects because it, it's similar to Roy Keane in that circumstance if we were to stay on the, the Manchester United theme you know in as much as Bill Beswick tells a great story about uh, Roy Keane Bill was the um, sports psych at Manchester United towards the end of the 90s and um, he, he tells the story of how they were they were having a, a very intense training session as they always did back then and um, how Roy Keane called for the ball from Dennis Irwin. He was like, Dennis! And Dennis Irwin didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't see him and um, pa- passed it elsewhere or, or something. We lost the ball, that's right, and it led to a goal. And and, and Bill talks about how, how Roy Keane ran 40 yards across or 40 metres <laughs> across the pitch and gave him a berating uh, in line with using uh, words and expletives that I, I couldn't possibly use on this show. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and Alex Ferguson wrote a Bill was standing, happened to be standing next to Alex Ferguson at the time, and Alex turned around to him and said, "And that son is is why we win." Uh, and and um, you know, just having the, the great fortune to work with Steve McLaren a couple of years ago at a, at, at a club and listen to some of the stories about Roy Keane, and there was definitely some rope extended towards Roy Keane. You know, perhaps one could argue that some of the questions that guy wanted to win so much and disliked yeah. losing losing so much that um, that I would imagine that some of his behaviours were fractionally. To, to use a psychological term, maladaptive. I would imagine that yeah. whether Barcelona would accept some of those, you know, I, I don't know. You could tell me better. But Alex Ferguson was shrewd enough to say, "Okay, I can accept these. I can, uh, because these are this is a cultural architect, as you'd say, and this makes a positive difference." Although Roy Keane might get sent off for this, I can kind of accept that and I may accept a loss here because I know when he displays these uh, behaviours from an adaptive point of view then he helps us win more often than not so there's definitely that crossover between a cultural architect and then having that adherence within the culture yeah 
Yeah, definitely. And that's and, and that's a big part of it. So I, I get people to identify cultural architects versus cultural assassins, okay. people that are actually going out to, to destroy the culture. Could, and I would say that Keynes a really interesting one without sort of going too deep into, mm. uh, 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 into him. But I think you're right. I think he was a cultural architect for a long time. I think the end of his career at Manchester United, I think Ferguson viewed him more as an assassin then. I think he was he was destructive to the culture and maladaptive to it, which is why eventually he decided that 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 he that he wasn't um, suitable to have around. But yeah. I remember hearing Mark Keane once uh, talking to an audience where somebody asked him about Cristiano Ronaldo, and they said, "How did you put up with his preening and his constant sort of admiring himself in the mirror?" And Roy Keane said, I had no problem with it. He said, because when he was looking in the mirror, we said what nobody saw was he'd been in training for two hours earlier than anyone else. So he, so if he chooses to use his downtime after that to admire himself in the mirror, his point was, he said, he's a good looking lad. Why wouldn't he want to do that? But he said, but it's not that he's not doing that at the expense of his day job. He's actually invested more time in his day job than anyone else in that dressing room. So he said, so I never had any reason to challenge that. Yeah, and and, and and as an aside to that, um, somebody told me, um, somebody who was in that environment at the time, is that Keane never had any problem with Beckham and and maybe his extracurricular activities kind of, you know, that, that he never felt he was distracted when he was at the training ground. He put in, you know, the extra yards. And yeah. so there was very much admiration, as you're saying, for Ronaldo and admiration for Beckham. And, yep, let's just get on with it. As long as you're working hard, mate, as long as you're helping us win games, that's all that matters. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's a great story. I did, I did a book a few years ago on um, called How to Think Like Alex Ferguson, yeah. where yeah. I interviewed right. a few of the players, and one player told me a great story about when um, there was a young player, uh, Kieran Richardson, at the yes. time turned up for training, and uh, he had a convertible car, he had the route, he had the top down, and music was blaring out when he turned up in the car park. He said, and Roy Keane went out of the car park and told him, turn around and go home. Again, probably in more Anglo-Saxon terms, but said, go home. He said, because you've not turned up today to invest yeah. your best efforts in training. You've been more interested in the journey in and having people like look at you and be noticed that you turned up here to do a job and prepare your very best. So, again, he's a guy there that is an architect. He's shaping the culture. Yeah. You're catching people in, like the Beckham or Ronaldo examples, but equally you're catching people out that are not demonstrating it and you're giving them real-time feedback. And that's the point around this chapter that, we're all pack animals. We, we're all social creatures. That if, that, so when we go into a strange environment, we look at how other people behave to determine what we need to do. So if you think about when we go to a party where you don't know anyone, your instinct is you stand against the wall and you watch and you find somebody that you might have common ground with and then you go and, 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 then you go and associate and try and assimilate with the group in that way. Yeah. So the cultural architect bit is to say, who are the people that can welcome you in? Who are the people that are going to shape your culture? Because in any dressing room, there will be at least four or five players that everybody else listens to. When they speak, everybody else goes silent and will follow their lead. Now, the key is in, the, in, in, in any dressing room is you want people that demonstrate the trademark behaviours to be the leaders, the people that are prepared to stand up and challenge uh, the maladaptive behaviours when they see it happening, but equally... To, to role model the behaviours that they won. So what they did at Barcelona, I mean, there's a really interesting period. In that two-year period I was describing when we first started talking, when Rijkaard had started to lose control of the dressing room, uh, I spoke to a journalist at the time that said that uh, Ronaldinho, after the 2006 World Cup, effectively fell out of love with football. Mm. And he said that, it, it, that he'd been such an amazing player before this, but then he, his love of football stopped. And he said that he started to allow himself to get tempted by other distractions like the nightlife and, and the partying. And what's really interesting at the club at the time was in that 18-month period when Ronaldinho had started to pursue these extracurricular activities, 10 out of the 23-man players that were a member of that dressing room separated from their partners or their wives during that period. Wow. Which, if you want just a, a statistical evidence, you go, this is the power of cultural architects, yes. where players start doing it. There's a, there was a story where Lionel Messi, when he was 18, 
um, ended up crashing his car coming home very late from uh, from one of Ronaldinho's parties. I was fortunate he crashed into a Barcelona fan and the club agreed to hush it up. But they were starting to see some of the dysfunctional behaviour creeping into the dressing room and the cultural architects were seen as at the heart of that, which was why Guardiola's first statement was the three main players, Deco, uh, Ronaldinho and Eto, would have no part to play in it. Now, it's interesting. The reason he changed his mind on Eto and gave him an extended period of 12 months is everybody will tell you that in Guardiola's first pre-season, Eto, his figures were, uh, in terms of the hard work in, in training, were far superior to anyone else in the squad. So he showed that he was prepared to adapt his behaviours to fit into the culture. So that was why he gave him that extended period. And then during the season, they had a fallout about some issue, which is why he eventually moved him on. But he was prepared to try and adapt it. So what they then did was, they, they put at the very heart of it, people that were making decisions through a sense of identity yep. rather than cost versus benefit. So rather than deciding what they could get away with and what they couldn't, they got people that just really identified with this culture and they put them as central characters to it. So when you look at someone like Carlos Puyol, the captain, there's a brilliant story when they're playing Real Numancia and they're beating, they end up beating them 7-0, but Thiago is making uh, his second uh, game for the club where he scores his first goal. And when he scores a goal, he runs away to engage in a samba dance with Alves, the fullback. And what's really interesting is Puyol comes over and breaks up the samba dance before it can get going. But interestingly, after the game, after they've won 7-0, in his press conference, Puyol issues an apology to the Real Numancia players. And he apologises for the behaviour of his teammates after the fifth goal. Because wow. he, said, he said, we wanted to beat you, but we weren't in the habit of trying to humiliate you. That's not what we stand for at this club. And I want to apologise to these honest professionals if they felt that we were behaving in a disrespectful way. So I use that as an example to say how you've got people there that really identify with the culture of that club yeah. and are prepared to stand up and, 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 and champion it, even when it might be at the, at the expense of their own popularity. Fantastic and great stories to illuminate your points and, and bringing it back to coaches of younger players, developing players. Um, again, let's come back to this notion of psychosocial coach if we can. I, I, I think coaches are actually often underappreciate uh, how they're in a position to create influences, to create um, cultural architects, to create leaders, if you like, which I know is going to be your last point, which we'll come on to in a second. But, um, you know, it, in every single training session, um, there's an opportunity to empower players to improve their ability to be cultural architects. You know, I remember when, when I was in Barcelona a few years ago delivering at a conference, and I think it was the, uh, th there was a couple of sports psychologists from uh, Atletico Madrid, I think it was Atletico Madrid, um, uh, how they had worked with the coaches to try to create this kind of uh, leadership program or influences. And one of the things they did was they, they got the coaches of the under 12s, 13s and 14s team to yeah. come up with their training sessions, come up with their activities and occasionally email out um, the activity to a specific player and that player, it was the duty of that player, they were 12, 13, 14 years old, that player to actually explain Brilliant. and drive the activity on a particular evening uh, of coaching. And, and what they're doing in that way is they're developing cultural architects, they're developing leaders, if you like, they're, they're helping Brilliant. players yeah. become more influential with their voice, with their actions. And I think if coaches, rather than just, again, come come back to I've got this blank bit of paper let's let yes we've got the X's and the O's yes we've got to know what kind of activities we want players to, 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 to do and then there might be the mental skills around that but how can we empower players to be architects how can we bring out their character their personality how yeah. can we uh, you know help them from a leadership standpoint talking to players themselves you know how can you develop your your ability to be a cultural architect 
context? How can you come out of your comfort zone? How can you do, you know, how can you engage in leadership? Which brings us to your last point, which is authentic leadership. So that seemed to be a big part of um, the Barcelona way, the DNA. Yeah, so this is, um, a, a, so this tries to help us escape from the idea that the coach has to have all the answers. So what do we, the, I like quoting the research that Simon Cooper and um, a Dutch economist, and his name escapes me in a minute, did a number of years ago in their book, Soconomics, mm. where they looked at the influence that a head coach will have over a team. Mm-hmm. And what they indicate is that the, the maximum impact that a head coach will have is around 10%. So they said, and now, now, Arsene Wenger. Now you'll get around the same thing. Arsene Wenger argues that he thinks it's around five percent. You know, um, um, Arrigo Saki thought it was closer to twenty percent. But the point is, nobody thinks that they are all powerful. So if we can settle on 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 the Cooper uh, uh, model that yep. has been more vigorously tested of ten percent. Yep. The question is for any coach: How do you maximise your ten percent? So don't make it all about you. Just ask yourself the question, how do I maximize my 10% in terms of the impact that I have? And a huge way that you do this is through acting through a sense of integrity and authenticity. Role model the behaviors that you're asking players to demonstrate. Because players, I see this in so many different contexts. I remember talking to a chief exec of of a big business once who told me that that he he believed in uh, meritocracy. I said, what does that mean? He said, everybody is equal in my organization. Everybody's got a voice. If you have something to say, you can speak up and you'll be heard. And I said to him, that sounds an amazing idea. I said, but why do you have reserved car parking spaces for senior leadership outside? And he said, well, why is that important? I said, well, most of the time it won't be. Most of your staff will ignore that. But there will be 20% of, of your leadership where you just need people to follow you on blind faith. You just need them to trust you that you say that you will do what you say. And I say that is the moment where those car parking spaces will become a millstone around your neck because people will point to them and say, I don't quite trust you. You don't really stand up for what you do. So my challenge is for any leader, you have to role model the behaviors that you're, that you're demanding. So the Guardiola example at Barcelona there's lots of examples of, of, of things that they speak about, his work ethic and, and his obsessive nature. But the one that I like best is that after 18 months when he was uh, in charge of the club, he got a contract from um, Sadel Bank, a Catalan bank, to do a series of leadership talks and lectures to their staff. And he received quite a lucrative contract for it, and he accepted it, and he went and did the job. And the Catalan press criticised him for being greedy and venal and vain. And he never responded to the criticism in the press. But what he did quietly was he distributed this fee that he'd received for these lectures to all the backroom staff. So he gave it to his to the masseurs, the physios, the cleaners, the kit man. He gave it to all the staff and never took a penny of it for himself. Wow. So he demonstrated this idea of he was putting the team for his own self-interest. Yeah. Now, internally, when you speak to any of the members of his backroom staff, they thought it was amazing. They trusted him implicitly because yeah. he demonstrated the behaviours that he was expecting everybody else to do. And he'd done it in his own dignified and quiet way. So I'd encourage any coach listening to this to say, how, how do you maximise your 10%? And as we've kept going on, a huge part of this is about the psychosocial side of it. Your technical skills will account for some of it. You have to know what you're saying and you have to be credible and you have to put on engaging sessions and all of that. I accept that. But a huge part is that 10% will come from, do you do what you say? Are you authentic? Are you genuine? Do they trust you? Well, I couldn't sum it up better myself. So I think that's that's a great way to finish. I think uh, reading this book, mate, has been absolutely fantastic. I'm continuing to dive into it, relating it. What I like to do when I read these books is, is kind of relating to my stuff and adding the stories and adding the little ideas and the principles and 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 um and make it make it kind of relevant for my language as well so a lot of this stuff i'm 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 taking these ideas and 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 bringing them into my world so and oh, it, well, uh, thank you, it's, it's, it's fantastic so 
it, it's the Barcelona way unlocking the DNA of a winning culture. So, Damien, just to finish off, how can people find you, follow you, get in touch with you, um, and buy the book? Yeah, well, well, first of all, Dan, thank you for having me on, and thank you for the generous comments that you've made around the book, because it does mean a lot. As I said in my introductions here, I'm a huge fan of your work, so it's really welcome to receive such nice comments. Um, in terms of people, I'm on Twitter. That's probably the one where I'm most active. Okay. Uh, and I'm on as Liquid Thinker, there, uh, if people want to do that. But the book's available on Amazon or Waterstones or any other good book sites that are there. But if people want to get in touch, I'm happy to sort of pick up any questions that people might have on the back of this and answer them. Or if they want direct them towards more information, I'll happily do that because... I'm similar to your outlook in, in the nature of doing these podcasts and the work that you do is you just want to help people get better at yeah. what it is. And we're both passionate around that. So if I can help people do that, I'd, uh, I'd be really happy to, uh, uh, to oblige. Fantastic. Well, Professor Damien Hughes, thank you so much for your time. Good luck with the book. And I, I personally look forward to speaking with you soon. It'd be amazing. Thanks, Dan. Cheers, mate. So that was Professor Damien Hughes. You know, it's really easy to look at Barcelona and think about how brilliant they are from a technical, tactical perspective. But I think Damien does a great job of bringing to life what underpins that technical, tactical capability. The psychosocial elements that help players be the very best that they can be under pressure time and again. I hope you enjoyed that chat just as much as I did. If so, please leave a review. And remember, you can subscribe to the show to receive updates about future episodes. I'm looking forward to the next episode. I hope you can join me then. Bye for now.